Politicians around the world and especially in Kenya are criticized for their incompetence. And sometimes what's used to measure this competence is having a university degree. So if someone wants to be elected for public office, should they have a degree? I say not quite and stick around to find out why. My name is Susan Wanjiko, I'm the founder of Wanjiko's Eye and here I discuss the relationship between economic development and governance so that you can understand, engage and influence the matters that affect you and I. Welcome to Wanjiko's Eye. So we're preparing for the 2022 general elections and the IBC has been clearing candidates to run for different offices. Now for you to get clearance to run for president or governor, one of the criteria that they were using was if you have a university degree and a valid one. And this process has been nothing short of dramatic with some allegations of forging degrees and whatnot. And Jimmy Wanjigi, he became a victim. But just to put you in the loop, this year in 2022, the High Court ruled that the legal requirement for MPs to have university degrees is unconstitutional. So it's no longer a requirement by law that MPs and MCAs have um, a degree from a university recognized in Kenya. And when it comes to academic qualifications, the ability to read and write in English and Kiswahili or sign language is enough. So first of all, why this education requirement, university requirement? It comes from the assumption that because of the education you've re received at university level, then you definitely do have the skills and abilities for the job. And the job here is to run a country and make laws pertaining to it. Yani ukona wisdom, knowledge and reason. And if you've been watching my videos, by now you understand that the government handles very complex issues, whether it's at the level of execution, that's the president, governors, and the ministers or cabinet secretaries, or if it's, uh, if it's the ones in the lawmaking side and the oversight side, that's the MPs, the senators, and the MCAs. They are literally holding your life in your hands. Now, I keep insisting do not answer economic and political questions without considering the dynamics of your country. So with that in mind, uh, doing that will help us answer if a university degree is important or if it's not important or if it should be a requirement. So why is the university degree requirement unconstitutional or against the constitution? According to the Kenyan Constitution, under the Bill of Rights in Chapter 4, Article, I, at Article 38, Section 3C, it says that every adult citizen has the right, without reasonable restrictions, to be a candidate for public office or office within a political party of which the citizen is a member and if elected to hold office. So if it's your political right, uh, go check out my series on human rights if you haven't. Now we go back to the language used. You can be a candidate for public office and without, and here the keyword is, unreasonable restrictions. Now, if you look at the statistics from the population census in 2019, uh, when you look at the social economic side, just about 1.2 million out of 32 million people in Kenya have university degrees. That's just about 3 to 4% 3 to of Kenyans. And when you look at that report, there's also a big number that has never been to school or they left school before they completed what they were doing, uh, regardless of whether it's primary, high school or university. So for whatever reason, this means that this category of people if they wanted to vie for certain political offices after they turn 18, then they probably would not be able to. And there are many reasons why people would never attend school or why they would drop off before completing 
whatever level they're in whether primary secondary or university so let me show you the different dynamics at play and sometimes all of them can be playing at the same time for example poverty and lack of school fees if you watch the news especially just after kcp or kcse results are released there's always a story about a child who is qualified but unable to report to school because the parents are unable to afford fees or there's always a story about fundraising and then even before we get to the fees in some instances there are parents who just can't get fair to take the kids to school also if the uh, school is too far away from home it becomes a challenge uh, teenage pregnancies like becoming a mother and some and a father before getting to 18 years can pull you back significantly then also there's the issue of childhood marriages meaning getting married before the age of 18 and also if you don't get the minimum grade then you might not be able to move on to the next level and by that i mean if the government decides that if you get below a c in kcsc for example you won't be able to go to university that's the cutout then there's people who just don't have interest in academics and that's absolutely fine so i know it may seem a bit straightforward when i'm listing these issues but let me show you how complicated these dynamics are because more often than not it's one of those dynamics that often leads to another so imagine you're born in a poor family um, you drop out of school at primary level then you get married off when you're still young and you get new responsibilities like you become a parent now but let's even give the story a happy ending and say out of sheer luck and hard work many years later you become wealthy and you've even done some work to uplift your community like you're living a decent life and you want to get into elective politics but remember depending on the seat the law says you need a university degree but to get a university degree you need a kcsc certificate and to get a kcsc certificate you need to have a kcp certificate but you can't get a kcp certificate because you dropped off you dropped out of primary school so will you go back to primary school in your 40s or 50s just so that you can now end up with a university degree just so that you can be able to buy for a political seat so i told you development problems are not straightforward and that's why we have so many cases of politicians forging academic papers and even inventing schools in the process now to show you that the situation i just described is not hypothetical if you look at the 2020 state of kenya population report some counties are extremely disadvantaged disadvantaged nikamasi kenya and the situation i just mentioned is common in these counties uh, minus the happy ending for instance 70 percent of women aged 20 to 49 years who were married when they were below the age of 18 years in homa bay in homa bay migori Meru, Tana River, Kuala, Siaya, and Mombasa became mothers when they were still children. And then another over 50% of children get married before the age of 18 in Tana River, Turkana, Samburu, Wajir, Isiolo, Samburu, and Migori counties. So you see their fate is almost predetermined just by the mere fact that they either got married very early or they ended up getting childhood responsibilities very early so they just get locked out of some opportunities So a lack of opportunity can lead to a condition of unreasonable restriction because I said one thing leads to another and it's not because that these people are unintelligent, life happened and they just lacked the opportunity. Now why this discussion on the university degree requirement is neither here nor there in Kenya is what you've seen in this administration. I've seen seemingly educated people use their knowledge to, to deceive you guys and defend some things that should not be defended. 
just out of loyalty to their parties and then some even just fail to apply the knowledge that they get into the real world and i listen to this guy sometimes but i can't tell but wonder do they honestly believe what they are saying last i mean no offense if we're really talking about the importance of education when it comes to governing a country president uhuru is a whole economist or political economist and deputy president uh, william ruto is a whole phd holder but i mean together the government has run down the country but just to be clear education is extremely important it's what allows me to uh, produce this content and communicate the uh, technical stuff in a much simpler way however remember education isn't just received in the classroom so if you want to gauge the competency of someone who wants to vie for public office especially now that elections are coming up aside from illiteracy and academic qualifications you can judge by what do they stand for have they been consistent in what they stand for are they bold in standing up for what is right do they have integrity issues such as bribery or stealing public funds and a very important one what have they done for their community as a private citizen and also uh, and finally we have qualified civil servants NGOs and think tanks to advise on the technical stuff so if the facts about a certain matter were presented to the MP or Senator or MCA, would they be able to make a sensible, independent judgment? Because at the end of the day, remember, they're not, they're not um, dealing with light issues. They're carrying your life in your hands. So anyway, I avoid putting in too many numbers in my content because I know I could lose some of my audience. So if you want to get more into the reports, I've put a link in the description box for all those reports I've mentioned. But again, don't fear numbers. Numbers just help us tell a story and ask more questions. So what do you think should be used as a measure of competence when it comes to political leadership? Let me know in the comments what you think about this matter. And as always, thank you so much for watching. My name is Susan Wanjiko. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share, and click on the notification bell so that you can be alerted when I upload a new video. And I'm about to do a very new exciting series where I'll really be talking to the voters so i will see you in the next one don't forget to like share and subscribe cheers